On this Tuesday night, the future of the AstraZeneca vaccine in Canada. Ontario will no longer give AstraZeneca as a first dose. This decision was made out of an abundance of caution. Well, Alberta changes course too. We'll explain why. Vaccination rates going up as case numbers go down. Will that make any difference to how we spend the summer? The outbreak in the oil sands, the conditions that led to Canada's new COVID-19 hotspot. How are you going to isolate people when you got so many people there? An infected worker speaks out. And deadly strikes, the worst outbreak of violence in years as Israel and Gaza are hit by rockets. And home at last, the long ordeal of a Quebec man detained in the Middle East, his secret journey back to Canada. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. We begin with breaking news about the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. Ontario has announced it is pausing its use as a first dose because of the increased risk of rare blood clots. Public health officials say there is more evidence people are developing adverse reactions. A month ago, the risk was believed to be between 1 in 125,000 and 1 in a million. Now officials say the risk in Ontario is about 1 in 60,000. There have been eight cases of the rare blood clots, known as VIT, reported in Ontario. It makes sense to pause AstraZeneca because the risk of severe outcomes with VIT um, are, shouldn't be underestimated. Alberta has also announced it will no longer offer first doses of AstraZeneca. It says its concern is supply. It wants to keep its remaining doses for people's second shot. There's not a lot of AstraZeneca left in the country right now. There are about 8,400 doses in Alberta and about 50,000 in Ontario. And with uncertainty about future shipments, Canada is relying increasingly on Pfizer and Moderna. Eric Sorensen has tonight's top story. Ontario has joined Alberta in pausing the use of AstraZeneca vaccines for first doses. Cases of blood clots after use of AstraZeneca have increased slightly, from 1 in 100,000 to 1 in 60,000, still extremely rare. But it's one factor in Ontario's decision to limit AstraZeneca to second doses. This decision was made out of an abundance of caution due to an observed increase in the rare blood clotting condition known as vaccine-induced immune thrombotic thrombocytopenia. Alberta was the first to stop using AstraZeneca for first doses. It's not about higher risk for AstraZeneca, says this specialist. The supply has dwindled of AstraZeneca, and so they are no longer able to provide um, enough vaccines to uh, give everybody the second dose. If there's enough Pfizer and Moderna vaccine, to, to replace the AstraZeneca, then I think that that is a reasonable thing to do. Up to now, more than 2 million doses of AstraZeneca have been distributed across Canada, but it represents less than 13% of the total. Moderna accounts for 22% and Pfizer over 64% of total vaccines distributed. But AstraZeneca's share will shrink further. Ottawa is expecting 1 to 2 million doses of AstraZeneca by the end of June. But more than 18 million doses are coming from Pfizer. The Pfizer share is sure to increase. Use of AstraZeneca will decrease to below 10%. Officials in Ottawa still recommend AstraZeneca for first dose and second. So we will uh, make sure that those who got the AstraZeneca vaccine, the first dose, can be provided with a second dose. At the same time, we're following the evolving science. The evolving science, however, includes a UK study expected late tomorrow that may advise that a second dose doesn't have to be the same vaccine as the first dose, which may tilt toward even greater use of Pfizer and Moderna. What I do uh, have concerns with is, you know, the ongoing uh, discussion, you know, what dose number two looks like for those of us who got AstraZeneca. Public health officials say AstraZeneca remains a safe vaccine period. But it looks like it will be used less going forward. Eric Sorensen, Global News, Toronto. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau said today Canada is on track for a one-dose summer, meaning enough vaccine is arriving to get every eligible Canadian a single dose. But that is not going to be enough protection to lift all of the public health restrictions over the summer. If we can do this, then we can have a more normal, better summer. And a one-dose summer sets us up for a two-dose fall.
when we'll be able to talk about going back to school, back to work, and back to more normality. To ease restrictions, the government says at least 75% of Canadian adults need their first shot and 20% must be fully vaccinated. As of today, the government says nearly 50% of adults have had at least one dose and about 3.4% have been fully vaccinated. Here's the big picture of COVID cases in Canada right now. The curve is bending downward, but the number of daily new cases is still very high, more than 7,200 per day in the last week. And there are still hot spots across the country where infections are out of control. One of those is Alberta's oil sands. Thousands of workers have tested positive for COVID. 12 plants have outbreaks, yet they are still operational. Staff continue to live in close quarters and workers are still flying in and out from across the country. Alberta's labor leaders are calling for the plants to be shut down. The biggest outbreak is at Canadian Natural Resources Horizon site. Tonight, Heather Urex West has an inside look at how the virus was able to spread so quickly. When this oil sands contractor, who we've agreed not to identify, took a job last month at CNRL Horizon, he knew there was a chance he could get sick. A lot of guys were like, oh, I'm not going up there. They're swabbing guys and guys are getting sick. Oh, that's the story I heard going up there, but the money was good and I thought, well, I'll just be careful. The Calgary man was one of thousands of tradespeople brought in by the company to perform maintenance on the site. But two weeks into the job, the 65-year-old got COVID-19. He spent several days sick and alone, in isolation on site. I was getting scared that I was going to stop breathing and, you know, whatever. Like, it was pretty scary and I was really upset. In a series of employee memos obtained by Global News, the company delivered weekly updates on the outbreak at CNRL Horizon. The memos state the site had been dealing with active outbreaks since October and there were 258 cases as of April 1st. But as the site entered into its scheduled maintenance period in which one of the memos noted there was a peak workforce of over 5,000 workers above our normal daily average, cases of COVID-19 began to surge. In an April 8th memo, 44 new cases were reported. On April 16th, another 84. April 23rd, 193 more. April 30th, an additional 268. And then another 219 positive individuals by May 6th. According to Alberta Health, there have been at least 268 additional cases reported since then, making this Canada's largest outbreak of COVID-19 since the pandemic began. At least two workers have died. One of my brothers in the, in, that I worked with before many times has died. The guy was a really nice guy. This is unfolding right now. This is not hypothetical. Uh, this is not something that we're worried about. It's happening right now. And so, you know, our, our members have, are, are scared. The Alberta Federation of Labour is calling on the province to shut sites with major outbreaks down. But the United Conservative government has deemed the oil sands essential. Instead, the industry is focusing on vaccinations. On-site clinics have already been held at CNRL Horizon and two Syncrude sites. A clinic is also currently underway at Suncor as well. But that's all too late for the thousands already ill and for the families of those that have died. Heather Urex West, Global News, Calgary. The federal government is committing $12 billion in funding for five major transit projects in Ontario. The money will go to four subway projects in the Greater Toronto Area and a rapid transit plan in Hamilton. The funding is part of a deal with Ontario and involves Ottawa picking up 40% of the costs. It is billed as the largest single announcement of transit funding in Canadian history. Public transit is at the heart of a strong recovery and a growing middle class. It's also part of our plan to reach net zero by 2050. Investments like these are key to making communities more livable and affordable, communities people can love to call home. The projects aren't expected to be completed until between 2029 and 2030. The federal government is stepping up its legal battle over the Enbridge Line 5 pipeline. Natural Resources Canada filed court documents today to formally oppose Michigan's effort to shut down the line that supplies fuel to much of Ontario and Quebec. The Canadian government says it could have a per permanent impact on our economy and energy security. Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer says she fears an environmental catastrophe if the tap stays on. Whitmer has given Enbridge until Wednesday to shut down Line 5. The company says it has no plans to do so. 
There is no peace in Israel or Gaza tonight. Across Tel Aviv, air raid sirens blared and the skies lit up with a barrage of rockets fired from Gaza. Three Israelis have died. It is retaliation by Hamas for Israeli airstrikes on Gaza, which killed 28 people and blew up a 13-story residential building used by the political leadership of Hamas. What began in Jerusalem after Israeli forces stormed into the Al-Aqsa Mosque while people prayed has now spread. Both Israeli and Palestinian leaders caught up in their own domestic political battles are focused on holding on to power and no one seems interested in making peace. Redmond Shannon reports. At a funeral procession in Gaza, a young boy sprints loose. Inconsolable and desperate to stand beneath his father's body. Some of the Gazan targets are political or militant. Other victims are innocents, just like this 11-year-old boy. As Gazans bury the dead, above them are missile tracks out of Gaza. More strikes were aimed at Israel Tuesday, killing at least two just north of Gaza. Later, more death as rockets fell on Tel Aviv, its biggest city. Gazans fully aware that Israel will hit back again much harder. I'm feeling this has to happen because if it didn't happen, we will stay the same. We will still be suffering from electricity, from water, from siege. Oh, like, we will stay. 23-year-old Shireen Saba says her family barely slept Monday night and fear they could be hit next, even though Israel has issued some advance warnings. A building of more than 50 apartments, it just, it just fell down. OK, what about the families of these apartments, of these 50 families or more than 50 families? Palestinian Prime Minister Mohammed Shtaya accused Israel of war crimes. His Israeli counterpart Benjamin Netanyahu said the strength and frequency of the Israeli attacks will only increase. The U.S. as Israel's biggest backer holds the power to help de-escalate. But the Biden administration sat squarely on the fence Tuesday. Israel has the right to defend itself uh, and to respond to rocket attacks. The Palestinian people also have the right to safety and security. Unless something changes soon, there are fears a new and lengthy conflict could lie ahead. Redmond Shannon, Global News, London. Cultural changes in the military coming up. The latest plan for how the Canadian forces will tackle misconduct within its ranks. There is another plan emerging for a badly needed, long-promised culture change in the Canadian military. The newly appointed senior officer in charge of rooting out sexual misconduct in the forces testified at a parliamentary committee today. Lieutenant General Jenny Carignan says she is still seeking clarity on the exact scope of her authority, but as Abigail Beeman reports, she has a clear list of priorities. That training is not actually achieving the, the aim of reducing uh, misconduct in, in, in any type of way. Revamping sexual misconduct training and the military's complaint system. It is not efficient. It's very complex. Two of Lieutenant General Jenny Carignol's goals. The woman who formerly led the NATO mission in Iraq now has more details about her new mission on home soil, revamping military culture. As we speak now, I am taking people away from uh, various other organizations so that they can start this very important work. Carignol hopes to issue new guidance on inclusive behavior for leadership within weeks and have a mandate in place by the end of this month. This is a serious moment for the Canadian Armed Forces, for the military police and for the military justice system. Trust needs to be rebuilt. The head of military police also testified they're working to support victims better as well as revamp training. 
Critics say a big problem is a lack of independence. The brigadier general insisted military police work independently from the chain of command, but acknowledged an issue of perception. That can be problematic for as a barrier of reporting to the military police. Leah West testified about her own military sexual assault experience and believes Carignan's appointment marks a positive change. The senior leadership has accepted the issue as a legitimate issue and is putting forward real steps to make change in a way that I do not believe was the case even three months ago. Karen Yule said she'll work closely with Louise Arbor and implement any of Arbor's recommendations along the way rather than wait on a final report. And as for the six-year-old Deschamps report on the same issue, amid much criticism over a lack of implementation, Karen Yule vowed to move forward on those recommendations as well. Abigail Beeman, Global News, Ottawa. Ahead, detained overseas for years for a crime he didn't commit. The story of a Canadian who is finally home. My government's priority is to deliver a national recovery from the pandemic. To achieve this, my government... Today, Queen Elizabeth carried out her first major royal engagement since her husband, Prince Philip, died in April. She delivered the Queen's speech, opening the latest session of Parliament and outlining the government's priorities for the months ahead. The ceremony dates back hundreds of years and usually involves lots of pomp and pageantry. It was scaled back this year. The Queen, who is fully vaccinated, didn't wear her crown, and only a small group who had a negative COVID test were allowed to attend. A Quebec man who spent time behind bars in the United Arab Emirates is back home in Canada. André Gauthier had been detained off and on in the Middle East since December of 2015 over fraud allegations. His son says he was a whistleblower who was just trying to alert UAE authorities to concerns related to a gold trading company. Instead of being rewarded, Gauthier was charged. The Canadian government stepped in to help. Mike Lecouture reports on the breakthrough that set him free. I feel like, a, like a relaxed. It's Andre Gauthier's moment of relief after spending years in and out of a Dubai jail. The Quebec businessman is home in Navy after being caught up in an international investigation fit for a Hollywood script. Gauthier builds its success upon. In 2015, Gauthier was working at a mining company and started asking questions about $30 million that allegedly went missing. Senior management disappeared, Gauthier was named CEO, and then he was accused of embezzling the money. He was caught as he fled to Oman, and Gauthier made this ominous phone call to his son. It was two in the morning for me, and he just said, Alex, I love you, tell your mother and my sister, I love them, and uh, just forget about me, I think I'm, I'll be long gone now, and I'm sorry. Facing 45 years in jail, Gauthier's family dug in and pressured the Canadian government to intervene and they credit all three foreign affairs ministers who worked on the file over the last two years. Gauthier was eventually granted a presidential pardon on all criminal charges, and then last week, he got the call he had been waiting for from the Canadian Embassy. Get a ticket on EK241 flight from Emirates to Toronto tomorrow morning, 9 o'clock. Gauthier spent three days in a quarantine hotel and is now isolating at his home with his wife. The Quebec man's ordeal seems short compared to the plight of Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor arbitrarily detained in China. But Gauthier believes their families should stay strong. Be confident that the authorities are doing all what they can at least to do this. I mean, uh, to, to take them out. A message of hope from a man who at one point thought he'd never make it home. Michael Couture, Global News, Ottawa. How to stay healthy next, finding motivation to get moving while stuck in the pandemic. Of all the challenges during the pandemic, how we look and whether we fit into our pre-pandemic clothes is the least of our worries. And it's especially vexing when celebrities whine about their circumstances. Actor Will Smith posted this, claiming he is in the worst shape of his life. Really? What does that say about the average 52-year-old man? Gwyneth Paltrow says she went off the rails drinking alcohol, making pasta, and even eating bread. Maybe it's just me, but is it wrong to say, shut up already? 
For most regular people who can't spend their days working out, staying healthy has not been easy, and that's okay. Robin Gill reports. All right, throwing those arms up. Pop-up fitness classes are taking over Vancouver parks. The climate is conducive, and it's socially distanced. Dana Schmall has been getting back to working out outside. The 38-year-old graphic artist admits she's been indulging. I'm a bags of cookie person. Yes. And how many bags of cookies? Uh, at least half to one. All those cookies raise the kilograms on the scale. At least 10 pounds, I think. Most Canadians can relate to the pandemic pounds. These latest statistics are an indication our calorie intake is on an uptick. 24% of Canadians report drinking more booze during the pandemic. One in five Canadians reported using a food delivery service. Frozen pizza sales are up 20%. Plus, we're not as active. A survey by McMaster University found people are sitting more and moving less. Canada's fitness guidelines recommend 150 minutes of activity a week. 80% of us are not meeting those guidelines. The chronic stress of the uncertainty surrounding the pandemic makes many feel less motivated. They're depressed, they're feeling anxious, afraid, stressed, and all of this is making it more difficult for them to be physically active. But some is better than none because it's also about mental health. Ruby Scott knows it's easy to reach for the chips and give up exercise. Instead, she reaches for the dog leash and a chance to get outside. If I let those things slide, I'm between that and letting my routine go, I'd be a mess. That idea is what got Dana Schmall back on track too. And she's not giving up her treats. I'm just going to work out and eat cookies. A cookie here, a cookie there, as long as she keeps moving. Robin Gill, Global News, Vancouver. And that is Global National for this Tuesday. I'm Donna Friesen. Tonight's Your Canada is Nelson, B.C. There are beautiful spots all over Canada. Please email us yours to viewers at globalnational.com. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you here again tomorrow. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye.